Thanks everyone for uh, coming and watching. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be here, but uh, at least you know I get to talk and show you a bit of the things I've been uh, mostly reading uh, over the past, I would say, one two years. This is sort of an ongoing synthesis. This talk of things that I'm I'm discovering in this space. Um, now let me start with a short disclaimer. So a career in distributed systems is both exhilarating and frustrating. When things work, it's like a symphony. When they don't, it's like an 11 birdie party where half of the kids are on speed. It's a quite accurate quote, I would say, from Jeff Darcy, who was from the um, project lead of CloudFS. Um, a few words about myself. Uh, yeah, my name is Manuel Bernard. I help companies. So my clients, either they call me when before they put a reactive system online and uh, to help with design, or they call me when the system is in production and there is a fire. It's sort of the uh, the two sort of projects I'm mostly doing. I'm a Lightband consulting and training partner, and I have a big focus on ACA, so I'm mainly ACA cluster. Aka streams now Aka typed as well, uh, but really the main focus is latency or low latency, high throughput sort of environments. That's what I spend most of my time doing is, is making things faster or making more flow through the pipe. Uh, and I'm also a scuba diver. So let's start with a motivational quote. Life is a single player game. You're born alone. You're going to die alone. All of your interpretations are alone. All your memories are alone, you're gone in three generations and no one cares. Before you showed up, nobody cared. It's all single player. I think that's a beautifully motivating quote by Naval Ravikant. Are you all motivated now? Yes. 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 Should I start a career in motivational speaking? Yeah. No, no. Don't. This, is, this is more of a motivation for his talk rather than to something for motivating you, uh, sorry about that. Um, but mainly it's about uh, looking at clusters and we think, when we think about clusters and distributed systems, we always think of them in this sort of view from above where we see all the nodes and you know, here we have three servers, S1, S2, S3. Um, but the reality of it is, the software we write, we write, it, it runs on a single node. It never runs on all of them. I mean, you can have it run and communicate, but the processes, they run on single nodes, okay? And they, um, they only communicate through the wire or the wireless or whatever. Well, if you build a production grade system, you better wire them. Um, and um, the thing is, this wire is unreliable in and by itself. So what can happen is that suddenly you don't see the counterpart anymore. Maybe the network is at fault. Maybe the process on the other side crashed. Maybe the process on the other side is a Java process. It's a JVM and it's currently running a garbage collection that takes quite a bit of resources and so latency goes down the drain. This is, or up the drain, should I say. Uh, this is very frequent actually that uh, JVM based uh, applications um, have trouble in networked environments because of long-lived garbage collections. So um, that's sort of the environment you're in. You don't really know. There's a lot of uncertainty. So uh, when we want to build clusters on top of distributed co uh, machines, there's three things we need to take care of. The first one is uh, th th there's this problem of, of discovery. Who is there with me? Is there anybody out there with me? Who is it? The second one is fall detection. Who is in trouble? Who, who is really there? Who is not? Who is currently flaky but will come back? So these are all sort of things where uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. And then load balancing because usually, I mean, there is two reasons for which you want to go distributed. Because going, building a distributed system is a pain in, in and by itself. So the only reason, valid reason you have to do it is that either you have so much things to do that you cannot do that on a single machine anymore, you can't scale vertically anymore, or you have a mission critical uh, thing that needs to be up at all times and so you want to have multiple computers so that there is a failover that happens and, and your application stays available at all times. If you don't have any of these two requirements, don't get into a distributed systems. It's just, it's just not worth your mental health and sanity, okay? So um, 
that are two reasons why you would do it. And load balancing is, is one of these very strong things. It's like who has capacity to take up more work? Who has network, uh, memory, CPU wise, who can take up more work? So that's one of these things. Whom am I going to give the next uh, bunch of process, requests to process? Now, the nice thing about when, when we take all of these three things, there is a very nice abstraction that fits together. It's one of group membership, okay? So group membership is a great abstraction for uh, when we have this, when we have this notion of group membership, it takes care automatically of all of these things. And in order to implement group membership in turn, we need, again, three things. We need fi failure detection. We need dissemination, that is to say, uh, pass information across uh, and around in the cluster who, you know, about nodes that join, that leave, that are faulty, etc. And then we need a way to reach consensus so that we all have the same view of the world. Because the worst thing that can happen in your cluster is that when people start disagreeing uh, on who is there, who is not, and, and think they all have the same view of the world and they don't, and then you have very very hard problems to debug. Okay, so let's get started with the first thing here. So who, who knows what album that is? Wish You Were Here, great, yes. Wish You Were Here, 75, great uh, great album. Also, failure detection, for some reason I can't explain, I'm really, I really like that. All this class of, of problems related to failure detection in networks, that's one of the things where I, I keep up to date uh, because I really like that for some reason. Um, now, let's talk about failure detectors. There is two key properties of failure detectors. There is the one of completeness, that is to say, um, if a process crashes, if a node crashes, everyone else is aware of the fact that this guy here crashed, okay? There is no one who still believes that the node here is healthy. That's what we call completeness. The second thing is um, accuracy. So. Accuracy means that we're not going to start uh, suspecting healthy nodes of having crashed. So we don't suspect, uh, yeah, so we have healthy nodes here and they don't start to suspect each other of having crashed when they, when they haven't. And these are the two sort of main key properties for failure detectors. There are more, more of them, like pesky little things like speed. You know, you have to take care of those if you want to build a production grade system. Definitely. We can't just keep up with these two here. But um, these two are really driving and help us classify failure detectors. Now, there is one thing I want to start with, and, and that is um, in distributed systems, we can't really, it's really hard to prove that things are possible, but it is possible to prove that things are impossible. I hope you follow. So we have these things called impossibility results where it's proven that it is impossible for a failure detector algorithm to deterministically achieve both completeness and accuracy over an asynchronous and reliable network. Now, unfortunately, all we have at hand are asynchronous and reliable networks, okay? So these two properties here, completeness and accuracy, we can't have them both, okay? We have to make a trade-off. That's the main thing we do in, uh, in distributed systems is trade-offs all the time. Uh, we talk, so we talk about strong completeness or weak completeness, where either all or some of the non-faulty members detect a crash, and we also talk about strong or weak accuracy when there are no or some false positives. We have to make a choice. We can't have both strong completeness and strong accuracy. That's not something we can do. We have to make a choice. So in practice, most applications will prefer strong completeness with a weaker form of accuracy. Let's say that it's, it's, it's better to have some false positives, like suspecting some healthy nodes to having crashed, than to have a situation where some nodes are not aware of a node having crashed. That's just how it, it turns out to be in practice. That's one of the trade-offs we do. And based on that, we now have a few failure detectors we can look at. Uh, but before we start, there is uh, yeah, the two strategies that I want to still mention here. There's two ways you can do failure detection. Either you do a heartbeat, so basically the node uh, that is being monitored is just sending heartbeats out, and uh, when there is no more heartbeat, it means that it's in trouble. Or there is a simple ping pong kind of thing where you have uh, 
a node, a probing node, will, a monitoring node will uh, will send a ping and it will uh, will expect an acknowledgement. And if there is no acknowledgement, then we, we talk about the uh, suspicion here of how it failed. So now let's talk about these failure detectors. The first one has a pretty cool name. It's called the Fee Adaptive Accrual Failure Detector. Um, the paper is also pretty accessible. It does a really good job at sort of introducing the, the, the sort of theory behind failure detectors in general. And what fee, what, what this uh, failure detector does, it, it introduces the notion of accrual failure detection. See, before that paper, it was either, it was Boolean. It was either process has crashed or it's available. There is nothing in between. And what phi does here, it, it, it introduces a suspicion value called phi that, um, that uh, sort of denotes how probable it is that a node is there or not. Um, and this failure detector was made popular by Cassandra. It's, it's the one implemented in Cassandra still to this day, I think. I haven't checked lately, but um, the advantage of, of that... Um, of, let's take an example, okay? Let's say we have a master node and a few worker nodes. Um, and what we could do with this failure detector is say, hey, if the suspicion value grows larger than eight, we stop sending new work to the node. When it grows larger than 10, we kind of notice, okay, this is not good, this is gonna fail. We start to rebalance some of the work that we gave to the, to the node that, that has this condition to other nodes. And then if it's greater than 10, we're just going to say, okay, let's give up on this guy and we, we remove him from the membership ring, okay? Now, uh, there's two graphs here. Uh, and again, here's a trade-off to make. This is the detection time uh, with the threshold. You want to set the threshold. And uh, it sort of grows like this. And you see here, around here, there is sort of this point where you have to make a decision. because. Um, if you want fast detection, you're going to take a small threshold. Okay, here we have a half a second. That's, that's cool, that's fast, right? But then on the other hand, uh, you have the mistake rate, which is also sort of the not quite, but kind of uh, opposite. So the, the smaller the threshold, the higher the chance that you're going to have a, a false positive. Okay, so you could go really fast, but do a lot of mistakes, or you could go a bit slower and you have a better uh, accuracy. So usually the sweet spot is somewhere around here between eight and 12. And if you're running this on uh, EC2 or on cloud stuff, just you know go for 12 because uh, otherwise you're going to be in for surprise. You're going to have a lot of false positives. Um, Software-defined networks are great, but uh, they also have uh, issues. Um, now another one who is uh, has a not a, such a cool name, but there is new in the name, so it's still cool. The new adaptive accrual failure detector, uh, and this is essentially also it's an accrual failure detector, but it's much simpler to calculate the suspicion level than phi. So basically, what they did is they did a bit of approximation around the probability calculation, and it makes it a lot easier to implement and to compute. So it's it's uh, it's cheaper to compute the suspicion value. And um, I implemented this for ACA uh, two years ago, and it turns out it's slightly better than the fee accrual failure detection in, um, in uh, cloud environments. So it's a bit more adaptive to the, to the environment. It goes a bit more with the flow of uh, packets getting lost, or, or generally speaking, the bandwidth going up and down. That's something you observe a lot, or at least I observed that uh, two years ago. Maybe it has improved by now, but um, that's just one of the things that you have there. Um, now another one, which I think did quite a bit of, uh, that, that was a really inspiring paper because it, in this, if, if you look at the paper, it uh, quotes a lot of biology papers. It's called the swim failure detector. As you swim lazily through the milieu, the secrets of the world will infect you. So you have this infecting and there is a lot of infection and uh, epid epidemic sort of uh, theory in this paper. It has both a dissemination and failure detection component. We're going to look at the dissemination component just in a bit. And it's it's a scalable membership protocol. That being said, it was written in 2002 and scalable back then meant hundreds of nodes. And if we look at that today, we're like, ah, that's not really scalable because we're now in the thousands of nodes easily. So, but back then that was the idea. They wanted to build a protocol 
that uh, made it possible for having a lot of computers in there and, and still not to pay the price of uh, too much waiting time or something. So what, what this uh, essentially introduced was the notion that we first suspect a node and we don't immediately kick it out. So we first say, hey, you're suspected and then there is a bit of a chance, there is a bit of a game we can play to see uh, if the node is really there or not. So let me give a concrete example. Uh, this is the, our cluster, this is our membership ring here. And then one node will ping another node at random, okay? And then for some reason, the acknowledgement gets lost or it's too slow. It's maybe a Java process here that runs a garbage collection. So the act doesn't get back in time. So what do we do instead of just saying, hey, this one is faulty, let's all kick it out. What we do is we ping three other nodes at random and we do another it's another, uh, it's another uh, signal here. It's not ping, it's a ping rec now. And, um, well, it's actually three in this example, but it's K in the paper, so you can sort of tune that parameter to the size of the cluster. Um, and then those, in, 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 turn, they will, in turn, they will ping the node that is suspected of having failed. And then maybe it replies to one of them, and that successful acknowledgement is brought back, so we stop suspecting it, okay? It's called indirect probing. Makes a lot of sense because sometimes you have links between individual nodes uh, fail. I've seen that in practice. It, it's just something that happened. So this indirect probing is one of the things that uh, SWIM does. Um, and then um, when I said it was 2002, now HashiCorp, the company you know that, that built Ter uh, Terraform, uh, Console, a Vault and, and uh, Nomad and all of these tools. They uh, started, they implemented Swim and they found that it was uh, great, but there was a lot of false positives, like a lot. And so they went and built LifeGuard on top of Swim. So LifeGuard is a set of extensions to the Swim protocol that uh, really, really does a good job. So when you apply all of these three optimizations that they came up with, you get to less than 2% of the false positives than just plain swim. So that's pretty cool. There is an open source implementation called Member List. It's written in Go. Um, and last year I said, hey, this is the state of the art. There is nothing better. But it was last year. And this year there is rap Rapid. Um, so that's another one built by VMware Research. And it's built, built for large clusters. Because here, for example, you see that when you have large clusters, like of the size of 1,000, and you look at a few protocols like Zookeeper member list, um, and you have some uh, failure where you lose 1% of the, uh, you have a network, a one way network partition for 1% of the processes. Zookeeper doesn't even notice it, okay? Member list, so the, 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 this one we just saw here, member list, it goes like, oh, it's gone, no, it's not, oh, it's there, it's not, so it really gets confused. Um, for 1,000 nodes, and it really takes a long time to sort of converge to a stable value. But with Rapid, so with this one, it just goes, bam, we're now down to 990 nodes. That's sweet. Okay, so if you want to build things with big clusters, you use Rapid. Uh, and then um, uh, it's an open source Java implementation, this one. Okay, it uses Netty. It's built, uh, it uses fast paxes to reach consensus. So the nodes, they first reach consensus using fast paxes. If fast paxes fails, you fall back to regular paxes. And uh, I mean, I haven't, I'm not aware of anything that beats this at the moment. Uh, I would say there's probably a bit of a consensus uh, trade-off to do in terms of uh, detection speed. It's gonna be uh, a bit slower, but then you have, you still you have this deterministic behavior that's pretty nice to have in large clusters. Okay, uh, that was it for failure detectors. Um, now, uh, who remembers or who knows what this album is? Yes, man, we really, really, we have people here that know this stuff. Pulse 95, dissemination. How do I get the word across? How do I share the knowledge about my view of the world with others? Members joining, members leaving, members failing. How do I talk about this in a cluster? Uh, and here we, we, we would have a dissemination strategy called multicast. But then if you look up multicast, this is what you find. You find Camille Fournier saying, just saw the phrase multicast support and a chill went down my spine. Um, 
or here. The almost uniform inability to support multicast on today's networks is such a humiliating defeat for distributed systems. I just had this conversation today at Uber. So it turns out we know multicast. That's what we learn in university. Like uh, we, we know, of course, multicast, blah, blah, blah. But then if you go to the, to the admins in your company that run the data centers and you tell them, hey, uh, we need the uh, UDP multicast. They will send, they will laugh at you and then send you away. They don't want to enable this stuff. Turns out, uh, it, it, there it is. It's not there yet. It's it's there in our minds, but it's not there in, in practice. Um, it's uh, not willingly or readily enabled. And even if we had multicast in our data centers, even if we had it, we would still um, have quite a bit of work to do. There is a 50-page uh, report from Xavier Defago and friends, uh, total order broadcast and multicast algorithms. I have it sitting over there. It's like it's like this really thick thing where it revisits all sorts of algorithms when you have multicast support. And especially if you try to talk about order with multicast, you're in for a wild ride because that's hard to do. So what do we do? We don't do multicast. So what do we do? Well, uh, we, we go and uh, anyone remembers Napster? Napster? Re legally downloading mp3 file or yeah something like that um so when there was all of this peer to pair to pair research done or research when there was all this pair to pair uh napster kaza etc cord and, and so on and so, so on um then we came up with gossip protocols and um you know one of the sort of most popular gossip protocol out there is um uh, random gossip. So on a T1, you ping a random node, at T2, both of them ping another one, at T3, everyone else pings everyone else. And it turns out that this works really well. It goes really quite fast. It spreads around quite fast. And um, there's more styles. So there would be round robin gossip. There is binary round robin. Uh, there is round robin with sequence checks. For some reason, these, these three never picked up. This is a paper from 2000. Uh, I'm not sure why, but um, this is this really never picked up. Everyone just does ra uh, random gossip. Probably also the easiest to implement. And then another way of doing uh, uh, gossip is to piggyback on another protocol. So remember SWIM? We talked about it being like this biology paper. Now, uh, they call this infection style gossip. What they do is they take an existing message here, the ping or the acknowledging or the ping rec, and they piggyback on the same packet here. There is still a bit uh, of space in the packet. You can still fill the packet. So you add a bit of, uh, of the gossip in the, in the packet of the protocol. So you don't have to send dedicated gossip messages around. You just piggyback on the same message. And that's, uh, that's what SWIM does and lifeguard does to some extent as well. Um, and these are basically the, the main gossip styles we have, have out here. But what does it mean when we gossip? What do we even gossip about? OK, so um, let's say I have node A and I have a table on node A that represents when I have last seen another node. So A has seen A zero seconds ago because it's A. B, it has A has seen B one second ago, and A has seen C three seconds ago. And then on node B, B has seen A three seconds ago, B has seen B zero seconds ago because it's B, and then B has also seen C one seconds ago. Now, if A and B exchange gossip, they exchange this information, and they merge the gossip table, what they will get is this view where A has seen uh, a and B have seen each other C, uh, zero seconds ago, and I've seen C one second ago. And this is how you can use uh, gossip to build a failure detector. Because you go, you gossip, everyone gossips, and the moment that the table has a value where a node, let's say, reaches a value of five, so a node has not been heard of for five seconds, you just kick it out. Okay, that's how you could use gossip to uh, build failure detection and dissemination. So that's something, uh, the main, one of the main things really in, is when, when you gossip is gossiping about membership. Because that's what you want to do. You want to maintain the same view of the world. Everyone should be aware of everyone else. Um, there are a few optimizations you can do. So for an example, in Acker Cluster, we gossip with a higher probability to nodes that have not 
yet seen by gossip. Because we keep a view, uh, in, in, in archaeological gossip, there is a view, there is a, it remembers who has seen the gossip, so we sort of send it with a higher probability to these nodes. Also, in Aga Cluster, when less than half of the members have seen the latest gossip, we speed up the gossip speed. Instead of pinging every second, we go for a third of a second to, to send out information. And then in Lifeguard, we, uh, it communicates by UDP, with UDP by default, but then there is this anti-entropy mechanism where nodes do a full sync with another node at random using TCP IP. And that way we sort of get more reliable delivery and it helps to speed up the convergence after you have a network partition. So I could go on with this slide for like uh, five or ten more slides, but uh, then uh, I would only be talking about this. There's a lot of really intelligent optimizations you can do, um, but let me instead go and talk about this one. Who knows what this album is? Yes! Wow! <laughs> Uh, and this is about consensus, how fitting, should I say. Um, <laughs> that's, um, I think, one of the, yeah, the sort of and more interesting or despairing fields of, of distributed systems. Uh, and there is a quote from Nietzsche here. He who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Um, I was from Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil, um, and I think it fits. I mean, maybe some people will di disagree, some, some of the people that have spent most of their career researching uh, consensus protocols, but for the rest, uh, rest of the world, I think uh, this is quite accurate. Like, let's talk about this distributed systems consensus timeline. So in 89, the consensus was Paxos. In 2013, it's RAFT. In 2018, the consensus is that computers are terrible. Um, you know, we, it's not getting any better. Um, and to start with the topic of consensus, let me give us a, a, a nice impossibility result, another one, about group membership, the stuff that we're trying to sort of get done here in order to build clusters. And it turns out that we have proven that group, or it has been proven that group membership with a single group is impossible when there are nodes that are suspected of having failed. So if you, it, it's enough for one node to be just merely suspected, it does not, you don't even know. It's, maybe it's there, you know, maybe it's just hiding between our garbage collection, but it's just enough for one of having being suspected that you can't reach cons, uh, group membership consensus anymore. That's great, isn't it? I mean, we, how are we ever going to get anything done in this field, I'm asking you. Um, what it means in practice is that it would be unwise to make membership-related decisions while there are processes suspected of having crashed. For example, in practice, if you, if you have a cluster and there's one node wants to join, but you are, you're suspecting another one of, of not being there, you don't want to, to accept it. You don't want to make it join the cluster because you could have like the, the whole thing they're diverging and one part of the cluster thinking, hey, this is new, new node is here and the other part says, no, I don't know about this one. And then everyone converges again and you end up with a mess. So don't, don't let people, don't let nodes in or out while there is suspect processes that uh, might have crashed. Um, now, how do you reach consensus or what sort of consensus can you reach in time? Okay, so I, I know I talked, uh, I, I quoted a few papers, but uh, really, the, the paper, if you get out of this talk and want to read a paper, read this one. Uh, Lamp Leslie Lamport, Time Clocks and the Ordering of Events in a Distributed System. It's sort of the, one of the, or the, I would say, fun, fun, uh, like most important papers in, in the space written in 78, Lamport clocks are a way to order events in a distributed system. It allows you to say which event happened before or after another event. In practice, it's not enough to have Lamport clocks because they only do the before and after game. But in, in practice, what you also can have is uh, concurrent events that happen at the same time. And if you want to flag those, you need vector clocks. This is how you flag concurrent uh, events. 
And then you have things called version vectors, or and they're uh, sort of grandchildren, dotted version vectors, which are like more optimized. It's similar, but different, because the semantics of these version vectors, they're uh, concerned with versioning and conflict detection, and not so much with concurrency. Um, so there's different trade-offs to do. And there's a blog post here. Um, version vectors are not vector clocks, which sort of help you make a distinction between these two things. Now, um, let me, this is the only line of code, or no, there's another one that you're going to see in this talk, so just enjoy it. <laughs> this is, and it's not even a line, it's just a case class, that, uh, that's the gossip definition in Akka cluster. And just to tell you that I'm not just talking about theory here, look at this third uh, parameter here. It's called version and it's a vector clock, okay? So these things are not just things written in academical papers. They're already they're used in practice. And I have a little demo. I'm going to show you a vector clock in practice in a few minutes and, and um, to show you that it really works and that it really does stuff, okay? So these are really uh, things we can use in real life. Uh, so this is how... Aka clusters gossip uh, sort of agrees that it needs to merge or something. It's using vector flux. Now, um, there is another thing we, we need in, in, in distributed systems. It's replicated state machines. So any sufficiently complicated model class contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-ridden, slow implementation of half a state machine. This is my preferred uh, definition of state machines. I think it most, uh, most of you are going to be uh, acquainted with what a state machine is, but this is a pretty cool definition by Pete Ford here. Um, this replicated state machines are just a method to synchronize a state across uh, machines. So here I have a client in yellow. It sends out events. We can order them using version uh, vector clocks the events are replicated to other servers and then each server up here applies the events in the same order to their state machine so we at the end we are sure that the state is the same in all of these three green boxes this is how we use um, replicated state machines to achieve um, redundancy or you know ways to fail over because now if this this node here the first one fails over i still have the two other ones with the same state saved here um, and then in order to do, to implement these things in practice, we need protocols. All these protocols, you heard of Paxos, Raft, etc. they're just ways to implement uh, these replicated state machines. How do multiple servers agree on a value? How do we agree on something? There is Paxos, which is from Lamport in 98. And then in, in 2001, he made another paper called Paxos Made Simple because nobody understood Paxos. And then uh, 13 years later, there was this paper called In Search of an Understandable Consensus Algorithm, that's Raft. Uh, Raft was designed primarily with the, uh, the aim of making a consensus protocol that could be taught to other people, it could be explained. <laughs> because taxes, nobody gets it, it's, it's really, really, well. Um, and then now there's flexible taxes by Heidi Howard, um, there is CAS Paxos by uh, Dan, David Ristoff, and then uh, Heidi also has a, a few more things, and she published her thesis this year, and that, that's really a great read. It really simplifies the whole thing. Um, and then the latest, greatest thing in uh, distributed systems research, really, in terms of consensus, in my opinion, are conflict-free replicated data types, CRDTs. They allow for strong eventual consistency. Me that means that things will converge. Even they, once the network is back, they will, they're, they will, they're assured to converge. It uses semi-lattices and constructs like this. You can compose them. There's two families, the, the ones that use commutativity of operations, but in practice that's really hard to sort of implement because then you need reliable uh, transport. Uh, or the CVRDTs that they use convergence of state. And even when your transport is not reliable, um, you can merge things at the end. So we have an example here. I have three nodes. They all start with a value of zero. And on the first node, by the way, do you see when I move my mouse? Uh, yes or no? 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay. Because I'm using it all the time. I, I don't know if you see it. So the first node, I'm starting to initialize um, uh, it with the value one, and on the second node, I, I put the value four here. And then now everyone is going to gossip about their uh, state. On the third node, I didn't initialize anything. And by the way, the, the function I'm using here is the max function. So I'm going to always compare two values. So the maximum between four and zero is four. If I'm going up this row here, the maximum between um, four and one is going to be four. And in the middle here, uh, there is an arrow missing. The maximum, again, between one and four is four. At the end of the day here, everyone ends up with the value four. This is because max is a monotonic function. Either it grows or it or it uh, doesn't grow, and it does the opposite thing. Um, but it only goes in one direction. Okay, that's what monotonic means. And using that, I can build these data structures that are uh, assured to converge and reach consensus on one value. And uh, yeah, th th these are this is I think the most exciting field in, in consensus research at the moment. One of the really exciting things. And then one of my favorite, my personal favorite, is reaching consensus without having to talk. So without actually exchanging information. Um, so for example, in ACA cluster, this is the second line of code. It's not even complete. <laughs> um, but this is like, there is an ordering defined here on the members in the cluster. And it, it, or it orders the members by uh, network address, by IP address. And the one with the lowest address will be the leader. So there is no leader election, there is no need to talk about it. Everyone knows the one with the lowest IP address wins. It's always going to be the leader. And there is no, no need to communicate about this. So in practice, I can cluster. How much time do I have left? Just so I... Thirty minutes? Perfect. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, will, I, I don't have so many more things, but I want to do a little demo, that's why. So in practice, I want to talk a bit about ACA cluster. Um, so in ACA cluster, the failure de detector is the fee adaptive accrual failure detector with a ping pong strategy. Um, it uses random bias gossip, so it uses random gossip, but it's biased towards nodes that have a higher chance of having already seen one thing. Um, and in terms of consensus, it uses the, the leader is uh, sort of designed, it's, it's there by convention, and membership decisions are driven by the leader. So the node that is the leader will decide when anyone is uh, allowed to join or to leave. And this is sort of at the basis of clusters here. On top of this, you have a few things. You have single, cluster single, that means there is only one of one thing in an act in a, in, a, in the whole cluster. There is sharding, where you sort of shard out um, uh, um, many, many actors on many, many nodes. Distributed data that implements CRDTs, and uh, that's pretty cool. Sharding uses both singleton and distributed data to function. And on top of all of this, you build your application. So you've got all of these things. Sharding provides you with automatic failover, uh, with automatic scaling, and uh, yeah, so this is pretty a pretty extensive tool set that you have at your disposal here. Um, now, let's look at how things work in in, mem in terms of membership states in ICA cluster. So the happy path is you have a node that joins, that so it's joining. Then the leader decides that it's going up. Then again, you, the node wants to leave, so it's in leaving state. And then the leader decides that it's now allowed to leave, so it goes into exiting, and then the leader also says, okay, now you can be removed. This is uh, the happy path. Now, the not so happy path, also known as reality, is when you join, you're up, and then uh, something happens, the failure detector detects a failure, an error here, and then you're in this pseudo state called unreachable. And uh, then somehow you go down and you're removed from the cluster. And now I'm going to take my camera and stop sharing the screen and tilt to something else. And I hope you can see this. Let's see if this works. Um, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What is it? 
it's a, it's a, so <laughs> it's a computer, it's a cluster. So these are Raspberry Pis, and these are LED strips here that uh, we had we have manufactured in Shenzhen. So you can just stick them on the uh, the port on the Raspberry Pi. And I'm now going to attempt to show you uh, uh, this in practice. So I built this little demo a few days ago where I show convergence in an ACA cluster. And now I'm starting the two first nodes. Oh yeah, okay. You can see them blinking here in red. And at some point they will sort of see each other and then they blink fast here. And um, okay, let me explain all of this stuff to you. Um, I have five nodes. I have five LEDs here. The LEDs in green here, they represent the, the, how they view another node in the cluster. So green means it's up. So I see myself as up. I also see here my, the uh, second node as up. Um, and then the, uh, the lower node also sees two nodes up. And then you have this blue light on the first node, that's the leader. It's on the first node because that's the lowest IP address. And then um, the, oh, I, I should be using something like this to show you the, uh, the stuff that will work, okay. So this is the leader here. And this blinking white light is uh, just a heartbeat here. And when the heartbeat is red, it means that there is no convergence. So there is a gossip going around, but not everyone has seen it. When it's white, it means everyone has seen it, things are as normal. So let me just start the third node, and then we can observe this whole thing again. Um, so I'm going to start the, the third node here. And where is it? Here. So it's red. And now here, these two just, they blink, they, you see them blink really fast and, and so the gossip spreads around and everybody sort of agrees on, uh, on uh, one view of reality. And the fact that it takes so long is just because I slowed this down a lot so we can actually see something. If I left the default values on, we wouldn't be able to observe anything. Just to show it once more, I'm just going to start everyone uh, up here, put so this and this. So now again, once more. Um, here, this node comes up, and now everyone sort of disagrees and then slowly converges, and everyone has converged. Okay? And now these two are still exchanging gossip. It takes a long time because I really slowed this down a lot. Um, but now everyone is there and the leader is up here. So let me shut down the first node. Where is it? Here, let me shut this one down. So it's leaving and the blue light, it jumped here. The leader is now this one and everyone else has seen is the first node as being removed. Let me show it again. I'm removing now the second node and turning it, um, turning it off gracefully. So it's going, going to leave, sort of, and then bam, here my leader is now, by convention, this node here. And if I don't do things gracefully, for example, I will disconnect now um, this guy. Goodbye. Um, and now it sees these two nodes as unreachable. And on this side of the partition, the two lower ones, it will see uh, this node as unreachable. So the red, uh, the yellow light means it's unreachable. Okay, and now, uh, yeah, the, the, the cluster is not in a healthy state anymore. Uh, let me see if I can fix it. Ah, uh, yeah, here we go back. Um, and we converge again. The partition is over. No, oh, on the first node, let me see. Will it ever regain control? I didn't test it actually on, on the convergent sort of thing. Um, yeah, still I have to I still have to fix that sort of thing. But you can see there is only one leader now. There used to be two in the partition, but now there is again only one leader. Okay, uh, and that was my little demo. Let me go back to um, show 
showing you this. Yeah. Okay. So here we saw a bit of the uh, we we saw a bit of this stuff here, um, and um, yeah. So now um, we saw we saw this bit. Uh, I think we saw quite a few of the trans transitions. We saw the unreachable sort sort of state, which was white. Um, you know, one one problem, one interesting uh, problem is how do you get from this unreachable state to down without having to do something by hand? Is this uh, sort of magic happens here? Is one class of algorithm which is called uh, the I don't like the name, but it's called split brain resolver. It's really more of a downing resolver, I should say. It means that you have to take some uh, sort of reason about who should be surviving the partition, which side should win. Is it the side with more nodes? Is it the side that has one important node in it? Um, this is, there's several approaches to this, and it's uh, also a nice, it, it's not so complicated, but it's complicated enough that you can do it in a wrong way quite easily. That's also a nice type of algorithm. Um, okay, now, how, where, where do we go from here? What, what do we, um, where, where do we, yeah, where do we go? Um, uh, this is sort of a personal take on this. Is, um, let me put this back on. Um, if you look at data centers and what they run, well, now everyone, of course, runs Kubernetes, but then you run things like Akka, Cassandra, Kafka, you run your Go stuff, you have console, you have all of these distributed systems. They all have the same problem. They all need to know about membership. All of them. Elasticsearch, um, you know, Cockroach, all, all of these databases, all of these distributed things, they all need to know the answer to the same question. Who is there with me out there on other servers, on other physical machines? And yet everyone implements that in their own way and everybody gossips about it. It's completely redundant. They talk about the same stuff, more or less. It's not the same strategies, not the same approach, but it's everyone does that, okay? And in my opinion, this is a terrible, it's, it's a really big waste because if you look at this thing now here, um, which you might have seen before or not, um, this is something I cared more and more and more about uh, in terms of in my daily life because this is something that, that could be fixed or sort of not fixed, of course, but we could take care of it a little bit if we wrote software that was just a bit less wasteful. Because data centers, you can say what they what you want, but they are taking energy, they're making things warmer. This is really scary. If you, if you compare it to the beginning, look at where everything was blue, at the end everything is red. This is really happening. It's not no joke. Um, and so I think this, this sort of problem here, this should be something like DNS. This should be something like one of the services that uh, is offered on, uh, you know, on each computer or on each server you deploy things on. There should be just a one way, a standardized way of saying, hey, I need membership. I'm, I'm this and this, this and that um, process and uh, please give me these guarantees and then let, let's not just everyone chat about the same stuff. We would be having so much less traffic in data, data centers if, if we if we had a, a standardized approach to this. I don't know. Someday maybe I will start doing something about it. But uh, in my opinion, that that is something where we still could uh, really save a lot uh, in terms of energy consumptions and data centers. And that's it. I think we are out of time. Um, I write about this stuff on my website if you want to read upon it. Um, Oh, these are the papers that were uh, sort of read or, or misused for this talk. Um, if you want to read them up, there is quite a bit of them. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that's it for this talk. So uh, thanks for listening. Um, are there any questions if we have still time for that? Hi, you mentioned DNS as a solution maybe for not so much chattering, but DNS but nowadays doesn't have any modality, any way to actually uh, tell us, okay, you are someone that is, you know how to identify you, how to find you, but I don't know how if you're up. So DNS doesn't do that. What do you uh, actually sorry. mean? I, I, 
I couldn't hear you that well. Maybe if you could get um, closer to me. Or how about now? Sure. No. Okay. Let me let me try again. Uh, you yeah. said something about DNS that you yeah. can use DNS in order to avoid that much chatter or gossip between uh, nodes, but DNS doesn't have a way to see if something something is up. I mean, you can identify yourself. That's what it was made for. It doesn't do any of that part. I mean, you don't know if it's up. Yeah, so I, I, I didn't say, I didn't, I didn't mean to use DNS, but I said it should be something like DNS that's so global or so, uh, you know, so um, standardized as DNS. Something where you say, hey, this is just membership, let's use this membership thing. And not everyone builds their own thing apart. It's, if we had that, then we would drastically cut things. Oh, the NS itself is not able to do that, I don't think. But that would mean that you should rely on what the node says, and that cannot be true, if you were to uh, use that logic. Well, my, my point is you have, let's say, uh, I, have a, I have three servers, they all run Linux, and all the servers run member lists, for example. And instead of Cassandra using its own thing, Akka using its own thing, uh, Elasticsearch using its own thing, they would all talk to this one member list service on the local node, which you could trust because it's running on the local node still. Um, but it start, sort of talks between, it does the network part. But that's a single point of failure. If that fails, it's... Well. But this, yeah, but, but the, the, you mean the process on the local machine could fail? Yes. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with you. Of course, it would need to be one of a very well sort of demon process, low, high, sort of one of the processes you give it, that you give more uh, resources or like uh, you guarantee resources for it. But there is a few in the Linux subsystem, if you look at how they run, like uh, that's something even you would run in, you could run closer to kernel space than like or a user space uh, process that's pretty high in priority. So something that is there that, that is sort of, I mean, if you think about it, DNS or the other sort of bind servers or things like that, they're also running, you also rely on them a lot and they, they don't go away. They're just there. Your DNS resolver is there on your host usually. So. Um, I would. I agree that there is another approach there. I mean, you, you need to take care of that. But I think this is easier. It's quite okay to solve. I think we know how to solve that sort of. Well, that, that part is true. You have you solve half of the problem because you don't solve the network part. You definitely yeah, know yeah, that. But, but then you use just one of the existing approaches, and and. But the point is, I think you would see a lot of improvement in a real life data center because instead of having ten services on the same machine gossiping, you would have one. So, I mean, you, you drastically reduce the... Like a demon for consensus. Sorry? Like, like a demon for consensus, right? One yeah. one thing per... Ma yeah, exactly. One per machine, yeah. That's, okay. that's yeah. It makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I wish you all a good rest of the conference and uh, have fun and uh, see you around. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.